I'm Dow Ryan. I live here in Cottage Grove and work a lot at the intersections of forestry, water management, and ecosystem restoration and regenerative agriculture. I work all over the state and throughout the Pacific Northwest and have been seeing the impacts of climate change on our environment and communities um, firsthand. And just wanted to um, have a, uh, an opportunity to share with you a little bit about the science, in case you aren't familiar with the science of climate change, um, and also some of the impacts that we are seeing locally and what we may um, anticipate in the future as it intensifies. So without further ado, I will jump into this here. And uh, the first bit of this is why is the climate changing in the first place? And as many of you probably know, our Earth is surrounded by a protective atmosphere and um, there are greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that make it a livable planet, it makes it warm. Um, and by increasing those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide, methane, nitri nitrous oxide, um, we actually trap the solar radiation that's coming in from the sun uh, doesn't have as much of an ability to leave the atmosphere. So it gets warmer and warmer and warmer in that protective blanket. We wouldn't be here without the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect actually makes the, the planet habitable, but increasing the amount of greenhouse gases makes the planet warmer. And that has many cascading effects downstream throughout the greater ecology of the planet. And how do we know that uh, the climate is changing? Um, there's a few different ways that scientists have been able to figure this out and attribute the climate changing that we're seeing today to increases in greenhouse gas emissions that we've seen since the inception of the Industrial Revolution and burning of fossil fuels. Some of these ways include ice core samples and seafloor sediment samples. And basically, um, what we're able to see when we look at samples like this is old oxygen uh, from hundreds of thousands of years ago is trapped in ice and also in the shells of uh, sea creatures that have been basically sedimented down into the seabed um, because they contain oxygen in their shells and the, basically their shells are calcium carbonate so they take oxygen out of the water and kind of um, shove it down into their shells and as they die they get kind of buried in the seafloor sediments and by looking at the different molecules of oxygen both in the ice and in the shells in the seafloor sediments, we're able to track uh, historic temperatures. And because the, the different molecules of oxygen basically um, can correlate to the temperature that used to exist on a planet at a different uh, period of time. And when we're able to track temperature, we're also able to track carbon dioxide. And what we're able to see is carbon dioxide concentrations and temperature track very closely together. And as carbon dioxide emissions have increased and decreased over time, temperatures on the planet have also followed closely. So we can anticipate that as um, carbon dioxide emissions continue to increase, temperatures on the planet will also continue to increase. What about other factors that contribute to climatic variations like solar flares or volcanic eruptions? And all of these things and their influence on global climate have been tracked and measured. And we can see that although um, they varied over time, uh, temperature continues to increase. And so that's one of the ways that scientists have been able to identify the temperature forcing effects of greenhouse gas emissions as separate from some of these other naturally occurring cycles that the planet is subject to. And so what you can see here is that the green is showing what the temperature variation would be 
with just the natural factors of solar uh, radiation changes, uh, volcanic eruptions, things like that. And with the human factors of greenhouse gas emissions added in there, you see that the temperature change is going up. So there's something definitely going on in terms of our impact on um, greenhouse gas emissions pushing temperatures higher and higher. And greenhouse gas emissions come from many different sources. Um, and so all of these sectors are ones that we're going to be talking about today in terms of how we're, we can, if possible, reduce them. Um, some of them are naturally occurring. So there's lots of different carbon cycles going on on the planet naturally. And then there's some that we can help to draw down. But you can see here, it's fairly um, equally distributed in some ways between forestry, deforestation, agriculture, industry. So that's like burning fuel to make products in factories, things like that. Um, energy supply, so gas, natural gas and oil, uh, transportation, and energy use in residential and commercial buildings. So why is the warming planet such a big deal? Some people think, might think, oh, well, it's getting warmer, then that means that we don't have to be cold as much, right? Might be good. But it has some more um, sophisticated effects that we should definitely be concerned about, um, especially because the projected changes are so great and will have downstream effects that are potentially really hard to mitigate once they really start getting amplified and increasing. One of these is the global uh, ocean currents. So this is a really important um, factor in global climate and global weather. And as the Greenland ice sheet and other polar ice sheets start to melt, the cold water that's coming off of Greenland, the, the fresh water, the melt water, is increasing and it's driving the, at, at a certain rate that we've been used to in the past, you know, uh, 15,000 years since the end of the last ice age. It's created the types of climates in various regions that we've grown used to and that our agriculture um, is based on and that our cities in the various locations that they've been built have been based on. And as those currents start to change because of increased ice melting, some of these major climatic um, currents from such as wind that drives rain, snow, and things like the monsoon storms um, in India and Thailand that are relied upon uh, by billions of people for food production um, are going to stop or slow down or change in ways that are somewhat unpredictable. And that leads to a highly uncertain future for those of us that like to eat food, uh, which is all of us. So um, these are things that have kind of long-term major effects that um, we really need to address um, in order to continue to have the stable, relatively safe climate that we as, as humans living in this civilization um, have grown accustomed to living within. Um, another thing that is going on is all of the, the carbon dioxide and methane that's been released from industrial sources over the past 150 years or so has gone somewhere. Some of it is trapped in the atmosphere. A lot of that has actually sunk back down into the ocean and it's estimated that 25% or more of all emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution have actually been sunk into the ocean. And that has led to kind of a buffering effect of what um, temperatures we, we should be expecting based on the carbon emissions that we've um, put in so far. Um, there's less, we haven't quite experienced the rise in temperature because of the buffering effect of the ocean. But one of the things that that's leading to is acidification of the ocean, right? Carbon dioxide is acidic. It gets pushed into the water. 
and that leads to um, shells and coral and many other creatures that live in the ocean not being able to uh, form their bodies adequately, which kind of disrupts the entire uh, food web of the oceans, which many people rely on for food, but also in terms of global biodiversity concerns, um, if we lose the ocean, uh, we lose everything. And so stopping that CO2 uh, forcing into the ocean is very important. And we're definitely, you know, some researchers are saying we're kind of reaching the limit of that buffering effect. Like there's only so much that can be taken into the ocean before it's really just going to be based on the atmosphere, uh, atmospheric uptake again. And we're really going to start to see um, rapid temperature increases, um, which lead to further destabilization of those oceanic currents, uh, et cetera. And so there's so many things at stake, so many effects of a warming planet. Um, again, we've kind of based our civilization upon things being relatively stable and relatively in the same place in terms of sea level. And as those things start to shift around, our adaptive capacity is somewhat limited. So it's really important that we're thinking first about mitigation of greenhouse gases and adaptation to the effects of emissions that are already baked into um, the system. So we, some scientists think that we're experiencing the effects now of carbon emissions that occurred up until the 1950s. And so the effects of what was emitted from the 1950s until now are still kind of coming on in terms of what we have to expect in the future. And so not only are we going to have to adapt to those increases, but if we don't do kind of a rapid drawdown of greenhouse gas emissions, those effects are only going to exponentially multiply if we keep pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And many people say we have, you know, 2030 would be a really great time to really be at net zero um, in terms of our emissions. Um, but that means we have to actually act, ideally, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, but really, now, we have eight years before the window of uh, potentially catastrophic changes um, coming for our civilization um, could occur. And it's not only our civilization, it's um, all of the life on Earth, which our civilization is also based on. So, you know, disrupting marine and terrestrial food webs means that um, there's, there's less life, less biodiversity, and more opportunities for things like pandemics and different um, unknown trajectories of species evolution occurring as fewer and fewer species um, can survive and also species are kind of uh, pressed up next to each other because of declines in habitat viability in other places, and there's mixing of um, species that may not have happened before. And so some of the effects uh, kind of worldwide that we can anticipate are um, extreme temperatures, staying longer and being hotter, than before, um, drought conditions persisting longer. And again, one way to think about this is that these kinds of weather events have always happened and people have um, you know, adjusted and adapted. We, there's been floods and there's been hurricanes and there's been drought, but the extreme nature and the duration and the, the temperature potential extremes like we've seen in India in the past two weeks, um, getting you know up above 120 degrees um, for weeks. Those are the kinds of temperatures that make it hard for our species to survive. Um, and ag many agricultural crops stop growing at above 100 degrees. So plants are just kind of in this state of shock as well. Um, and animals have trouble surviving in heat like that. So there's a point at which adaptation 
you know, is not really an option, um, or it's just, you know, things start to die. And we really hope that we can kind of mitigate the, those types of extremes, but we're likely going to be seeing them more and more. A warmer atmosphere also holds more water. And so for every one degree rise in temperature, um, we can see 4% more water being held in the atmosphere. And so that means that storms that come through can be more intense, drop more rain, and not really have like the kind of consistent um, light rain that we might have had here in the past, but we, all, we instead have these kind of periodic dumps of an inch or two. And that also leads to more intense storms, so hurricanes and cyclones, as I'm sure we've all seen, have become a lot more intense. We're seeing like category four and five as just kind of the norm when we are tracking hurricanes um, in the US at least, and cyclones as well, which are basically hurricanes in another part of the planet. Rapid warming of the poles is another uh, thing that scientists are looking at pretty uh, in depth because uh, a lot of the, the kind of rapid rise in temperature is actually occurring in places where it's frozen and you can kind of tell that the, um, the temperature rise is distinct. And one of the things that this may be leading to is, is a disruption of the jet stream, which usually is banded by this kind of low pressure system that keeps the weather kind of up, the cold weather kind of up in the, the cold area of the poles. And we're starting to see some examples of the jet stream starting to break down. One of those um, events was um, the frost and the major freeze that occurred in Texas last year where just all of a sudden the, the kind of piece of the polar jet stream dipped all the way down into Texas and stayed there for a few days in a place where it almost never freezes. Um, and that was, you know, Ted Cruz went to Mexico and, you know, uh, tried to escape the cold, but that was a very extreme event. And although it was cold, it still can be attributed to overall global warming because the jet stream is becoming destabilized. Some think, and you know, it's, it's hard with climate change attribution to say like this definitely was related to climate change, but you know, there's a whole branch of science called climate change attribution where people are really looking at how can we find that signature in all of these different extreme events. One of the things that we experienced here last year was the heat dome, right? And basically what that was, was a high pressure system that just came in and stayed. It didn't move, it was kind of stuck. And um, the temperature, you know, extreme, who would have thought that it would be 115 degrees here? Um, you know, that, that kind of blew the socks off of many uh, meteorologists and climatologists. They weren't expecting that kind of extreme temperature um, in this area until, you know, a much later kind of potential uh, climate change scenario. And we keep seeing these reports of like, oh, this was totally unprecedented and we were expecting this to happen in 250 years of further greenhouse gas emissions, but it's happening now. And so we should anticipate that more things like that are gonna continue to happen. And so, you know, kind of looking at some of these effects, one of the things that it, it also um, can lead to is that uh, less cold weather overall, more hot weather, more extreme hot weather, and what this does is it kind of pushes uh, plant and animal communities also to the edge of where they can survive. Um, and this is also exacerbated by drought and, and water availability. And when it comes to um, agriculture and forestry, um, we really need to be thinking about how the things that we're growing, both for our own uh, subsistence and also for economic viability, whether they're going to continue to be viable um, in 
the areas where they're currently grown or produced or relied upon as these shifts continue to occur. So, and there's a lot of kind of associated socioeconomic effects um, that go along with climate change, including displacement of people who are fleeing areas that are no longer habitable or where um, subsistence agriculture, which is practiced by, you know, upwards of a billion people on the planet, um, where people don't have access to wells or other technologies that make agriculture here a little bit more resilient to some of these climate um, impacts. You know, if you're completely reliant on rainfall and it just doesn't come, um, then what are you going to do? You are going to leave to find a better life for yourself and your family. and. You know, we're starting to, we've been seeing these kinds of movements happening already, and it's going to continue. And so, you know, one kind of facet of adaptive planning is planning for climate refugees and how we are going to welcome people into our communities who have been displaced by the effects of climate change. There's also kind of, you know, some large numbers associated with infrastructure damage um, related to extreme weather and storms and loss of coastal property, loss of labor. Last year, Oregon passed a law um, protecting farm workers from working in extreme heat, which is really great. Um, so there's all of these kind of um, things that we need to take into account as we consider um, all of the aspects of our lives that the climate uh, affects. And importantly, here, you know, in the United States, we're responsible for a large portion of global greenhouse gas emissions. It, but many of the impacts, especially the extreme impacts up until now, are being felt by the people, people who had much less responsibility in creating greenhouse gas emissions. And so that's another kind of aspect of this conversation is just understanding where the burden of climate action should take place. And, you know, for many people, people think that it should be here in well-resourced well countries. Like, we should be really the leading force on climate action and also financing the adaptation and mitigation um, strategies of other places where people have been less um, responsible for greenhouse gas emissions. And locally, you know, we've all kind of experienced some of these impacts. There was the Holiday Farm fire in 2020, and at the same time, several other fires throughout Oregon, and the air quality was uh, very low for our area for a long time. And last year, you know, Cottage Grove Lake was as low as I've ever seen it. And um, we've also seen over the past several years some die-off of Douglas fir. And there's some estimates um, from the Forestry Department of OSU that Douglas fir may not exist in the valley floor um, after 2050. That, you know, this year we're experiencing somewhat of an, an anomaly, you know, compared to the past 20 years or so where we're seeing a, a very wet spring. In fact, April was the wettest April on record in Oregon, which is another kind of swing of the, the anomalous extremes that we keep experiencing. But the last several years have been so dry and, um, many of the plant species that are native to this area are stressed. Um, and some very economically important ones, like Douglas fir, are experiencing drought stress, which leads to them being more susceptible to pests, like the fir engraver beetle, because they don't have the sap to push out the beetle that's coming along to um, eat it. And so all of these things are playing out here locally. And I think I'm not sure when it was, but it was a couple of years ago, maybe 2019, where we had three uh, events that where Red Cross shelters were set up in Cottage Grove. There was the snowpocalypse, and then there was 
the flood, right, where the cottage grove, um, where the Coast Fork of the Willamette and the Cottage Grove uh, Reservoir kind of overflowed into that trailer park area just below the, the dam. Um, and I forget what the other one was, if it was an ice storm. Um, but I just remember thinking like, wow, you know, this was a really kind of anomalous year. Like we don't usually have that occurring in our community, but should we be anticipating that those kinds of events um, are going to happen more and more and more and more people are going to be affected by them and need assistance. And what does that assistance look like in our community? Is it a federal response? Is it a state response? County, community, neighborhood, um, family, like really starting to think about the interplay of how we're going to respond to and adapt to these changes is really important. I just wanted to talk about fire a little bit because although we are experiencing a wet spring, there is a concern that this will lead to increased vegetation growth. It's great, we're all probably experiencing that um, where we live to some extent as the grass you know, emerges to get like four or five feet tall in some places um, by this time. But that means when it dries out, there's more fire danger. And so even though this is a good thing now and our lakes will be full, um, on the broader scale, we could be looking at more potential fire impacts if we get um, a really hot, dry summer. And if in successive years, we have um, more of weather like we've seen in the past several years where it actually is very hot and dry. These are just some pictures of the snowpack in the Cascades. Um, between 2014 and 2015, we see uh, a marked reduction in snowpack. And this year, again, somewhat of an anomaly, we're actually at over 100% of snowpack capacity in this part of the Cascades. Some parts of Oregon are still experiencing drought conditions like southeastern Oregon and around the Klamath Basin. So there's somewhat of, um, you know, local anomalies. We're looking pretty good this year, but the general trajectory and the, what we can anticipate is less snowpack, more moisture coming in the form of rain and less coming in the form of snow, which leads to less summer water availability in rivers that are fed by uh, snowpack, which are all of the rivers coming out of the Cascades, like the Mackenzie and the Clackamas and the Santayam. And these major rivers that feed the agricultural bounty that's produced by the Willamette Valley. Oh, here's a little range map for predicted range of Douglas fir um, over the next several decades. And you can see there in red predicted declines in Douglas fir habitat uh, by 2090. It's almost completely gone from um, all the way to the crest of the Cascades. So that's going to have major economic implications for our area where there is a, a timber economy. There's also impacts on fish habitat. One interesting thing, this is a monthly flow at the Dalles Dam. So again, thinking about power, el electricity, you know, we're lucky to have um, a lot of clean um, energy resources available to us in the form of hydroelectric power in this area. But as climate, projected climate change impacts kind of continue to roll out, there's going to be less water potentially available at the, the historic time to enable um, some of these systems to run as they were designed. And we're starting to see this in, in Lake Mead in the southwest. Like right now, there's a huge drought. And the, for the first time, the, the, since um, the dam was built at Glen Canyon, there, the water intake is above the, the water level. And that means, you know, all of the water and potential electricity that's meant to be generated there is not going to be available. So when we start to see extreme drought conditions, it has all of these other effects on the systems that we've designed to be powered by the, those natural resources. This is, um, it's not very funny, but um, this is actually a picture of what 
uh, Portland would look like given a 250 foot sea level rise, which is what would happen if all of the ice on the planet melted. This is basically downtown Portland. This is Forest Park. There's the Sea of Tualatin, which is currently um, a very populated area. So, you know, it's somewhat fanciful, but ideally we're going to um, stop this train before we get to a point of having an ice-free planet because that's going to be a very different um, scenario that we're dealing with. And just to go briefly into what we can do now, you know, moving beyond fossil fuels, improving energy efficiency, setting ambitious climate goals, making sure everybody benefits as we consider our climate action plans, climate smart forestry and agriculture, supporting local efforts to improve community food and water security and emergency preparedness, and supporting education and job creation op entrepreneurship opportunities in the regeneration economy. So thinking about how we can jumpstart all the needed work that can be done in construction and in the field of um, energy generation and in the field of ecosystem restoration and forestry and agriculture, all of this kind of has to come as a groundswell as we um, engage in these activities ourselves and train youth to do these things and engage everybody in a just uh, transition off of fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions based um, systems survival that we currently have in place now. And part of the point of this town hall today is to really um, start that process of community-based adaptation and coming together to brainstorm how we can come up with solutions that work here to address some of the local impacts so that we can make a difference on this global issue. And hopefully this is the kind of thing that's happening in communities all over the country, all over the world as you know, everybody's experience and um, uh, skills that they bring to the table are unique and diverse and rooted in place, and we can really um, make use of that in a regenerative way. So we look forward to getting into it with you today. Thank you. <laughs>